The restaurant discussion is called to an end, but I hope you've got some new places on your list to try out. It's great to see a good crowd today. I am Wade Culp, your president for this Rotary year. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Greenville. We've got a great meeting. I'm, I've been enjoying speaking with our speaker already today, and I'd like to invite Paul Wickensheimer up to lead us in an invocation and the pledge. Thank you. Please stand. Shall we pray? Our Father, we're grateful for Rotary, grateful for the friendships, fellowship that we can have, grateful for the community service that we can be involved in and the international service, just for the uh, good times that we can have in serving with our friends in Rotary. Pray your blessing upon our meeting today, our speaker. Give you thanks for the food that's been provided for us. Bless our country today. Provide for our elected officials in Washington. So they make tough decisions and that they would represent us well. Pray for the folks in England too and the tremendous loss that they're suffering in the mourning that they're going through. We thank you for the relationship that we have with the United Kingdom and just pray your blessing upon the Queen's family during this time. Be with them during this transition as well. Father, we give you thanks for all you've done for us, for your blessings. Undertake for us and meet our needs. We pray in thy name. Amen. Join with me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon. I'd like to introduce our guests and any visiting Rotarians. And when I call, me, call your name, if you could please stand until we're uh, when you're introduced. The guests, uh, Kristen Irwin, guests of Lauren Payne. If you could stand, Lauren, or Kristen, okay, there you are. Very good. Cynthia Flynn, guest of Catherine Palanco, Calano. Claire Penuel, guest of Sherry Penuel, David Sims, guest of the club, David Junker, guest of the club, Amy Albert, guest of the club, Terry and Brian Dorian, guest of the club, Lindsay Niedrenhaus, guest of the club, and Lucas Young, guest of the club. We're excited that you're here and glad that you're here and, and enjoy our luncheon and hope that you uh, enjoy our Rotary Club. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's time to introduce new members. So Amy and Jackie and Anisha, if you'll join me up here. Yay. All right. Thanks, ladies. Look at all these women coming in. Woo okay, I'm gonna start with Anisha. So um, Anisha uh, is a licensed insurance advisor. She has one daughter and um, her passion is called to serve and be in service to others and to be an advocator and resource guide to underserved communities. Is she not a perfect fit for us guys? She said that um, she discovered a few years ago that her God-given talent was exhortation. And I looked that up because I wanted to make sure that was an extortation. <laughs> and just for those of you, exhort exhortation is an address or communication em emphatically urging someone to do something. What a great Rotarian, y'all. Yeah? Okay. Um, and she is excited to get involved with the community. Now, Anisha has told me that people have a hard time with her name. They have called her Amnesia. <laughs> they have called her An An Alicia. They have called her all kinds of names. And so she has a way for y'all to remember her name. And she explained it to me on the phone. So I'm going to get Anisha to tell y'all how to remember her name. Yep, yep. So that's how you're going to remember Anisha coming forward. As you see her, you point to your knee and you know who she is, okay? 
The next one is, um, is Jackie Berkshire. Berkshire or Berkshire? Berkshire? Berkshire. Jackie Berkshire. Jackie is currently the Director of Development for the Kane Halter YMCA, and she has been there, uh, came in June after 15 years in higher ed. It's pretty impressive. Um, and uh, that she has most recently been the VP for Advancement at Presbyterian College. Um, she has a blended family. Guess how many children she has? It will fit on two hands. <laughs> Not nine children in her blended family and one grandson. So that's two full hands. Okay. Um, and her passion is to provide resources necessary to give the underserved populations fair opportunities. She doesn't believe in equal. She believes in fair. And we are excited to have her here. Now, Jackie says that she's a foodie. And that she's also a scuba diver. So I want to know, have you ever caught your own food while scuba diving? Since you're a foodie and a scuba diver. We did. <laughs> so we had um, lion chips when we were in Curacao. That's great. Yeah, so y'all know who to catch fish for you now. Okay. And um, last is Amy Wood. Um, she probably really needs no introduction, but um, Amy has reached the point in her life that I did when I joined Rotary. Your children are out of the house. You're looking for something else to do. And what do you do? You join Rotary, right? Okay. So we're excited to have her. She has three, um, three daughters and her passion is to help her viewers um, tell their stories. And she is ready to jump right in. She's excited about being on the Kringle Holiday Village Publicity Committee. And she also is gonna work with our social media team. So we're excited to have that. Um, her fun fact is that she spent her some of her teenage years in Stockholm, Sweden. Okay, guys, one of my favorite bands is from Sweden. Who do you think it is? Guess who she sang with? I'm going to let you tell about it. I got to touch you, too. Is that that cool? <laughs> so look at your great new members, Anisha. Amy and Jackie, and welcome them to Rotary with a warm round of applause. Thank you all so much. We're excited to have you. Yeah. And Mike, I think you're up. Thanks, Caroline. And welcome aboard, new members. Um, not to disrupt the female theme that today, you'll notice on the agenda it says that Laura is giving the Kringle update. Hopefully you can tell I'm not Laura, uh, but, I, but I am Mike Sarvis. I'm the sponsorship chair for Kringle Holiday Village this year. I just want to give you a, a quick update on where we stand. Uh, we're way ahead of where we were last year. Um, so that's a good feeling. Uh, our efforts last year uh, did not go uh, unpunished. Uh, we exceeded our goal last year of 40,000 in sponsorship. So this year it's 65,000. <laughs> so we're well on our way. Currently, we stand at about $38,150 committed. And, um, and, and nearly half of that collected uh, already, which is even better. Um, but even though we have a head start, we still have a long way to go. Um, so this is kind of the, the all hands on deck call. Um, hopefully everybody has received information uh, on the sponsorship levels and the sponsorship benefits. If you haven't, uh, please see me or one of our committee members after the meeting. And that's Jane Dyer, David Carfolite, who is here, Michael Evans, uh, and Marty Holcomb. Uh, we'll be ha happy to, to share any of that with you. Uh, we still have a number of sponsorship elements in our majestic level, which is $5,000. We have a few left in our royal level, which is $2,500. Um, and then we have unlimited space for $1,000 uh, sponsorship level. Um, for those that maybe can't quite get to $1,000 um, last year, and we're opening it up again this year, if you can put two $500 sponsors together, uh, we'll, we'll recognize that and both as a $1,000 level sponsor. Um, so if you want to team up with somebody, you know, let me know and we'll make sure we get that taken care of. If you can't quite 
get to the thousand, but you still want to support, which we highly encourage, um, we're going to develop a link uh, to the website where you can donate uh, to the event. And so we appreciate any level of support. Um, so again, we, we appreciate uh, Ingalls stepping up as our presenting sponsor. Uh, David Carflight's been very instrumental in helping uh, facilitate that relationship. But uh, we appreciate all of our sponsors that have stepped up so far. But uh, we really hope that everyone would consider helping support the event at some level. Uh, so if you have any other questions, I'll be around after the meeting and we would love to uh, take your check. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Beth Paget. I'm the District Rotary Foundation Chair. But more importantly today, I'm a member of this club and also serve as the Paul Harris Fellow Chair. Uh, today, we're going to recognize some people who uh, have uh, attained their uh, multiple Paul Harris Fellow. The motto of the Rotary Foundation is doing good in the world. And these are people who have been doing good in the world for quite some time and uh, at a sustained level. Uh, the Rotary Foundation is our charity of choice as Rotarians. It's our way to collectively come together, raise the funds to do some just truly life-changing work throughout the world and in our own community. Uh, the Rotary Foundation has seven areas of focus that range from maternal and child health to water and sanitation to peace and conflict resolution. Uh, Paul, Harris felt, uh, Paul Harris, as you know, in 1905 founded um, Rotary with three of his friends. And 12 years later, they decided Rotary needed a way to do good in the world, which is where the motto comes. And that was uh, the basis for founding our Rotary Foundation. Um, we have, our club is a strong supporter with deep roots of supporting the Rotary Foundation. Uh, in 1957, uh, they created what's called the Paul Harris Fellow, which is a way to one, recognize people who have given at a level uh, that's, that's admirable, but also to very transparently encourage more giving. $1,000 was set at that time, 1957. And as the world changed, as we know about now, inflation takes place, sort of things like that, they created multiple Paul Harris Fellows. So for every level above $1,000, you, you get another Paul Harris Fellow recognition, plus one, plus two, all the way up to plus eight, with, with the next level being major donor. So today we're recognizing three people who are Paul Harris Fellows plus one, two, or three. And I just wanted to give you a little background so you can appreciate um, the, the level of giving and the level of support for the foundation. You can achieve that through a direct gift of a thousand over a number of years or a combination of giving plus matching foundation recognition points. And so today I would like to call up three people, uh, John Kent, Mandy Dutton, and Paul Wickensheimer. <clears throat> President Wade's going to help me in presenting to John Kent, his Paul Harris Fellow Plus One, to Mandy, her Paul Harris Fellow Plus Two, and to Paul Wickensheimer, Paul Harris Fellow Plus Three. Thank you all so very much. So I'm Ramona Farrell, and I have the great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Camber Parker, today. Uh, Camber hails from Baltimore, Maryland, arrived in Greenville to attend Furman, graduated in 2017, and just things you learn as you come into the meeting today. So while at Furman, she also volunteered or worked over at the Woodlands. And so Jim and Joan Perrier, our club members, are actually like her extended or adopted grandparents uh, because she got to know them through her involvement there and they've stayed in close contact. So Jim and Joan, thank you for taking care of her. Um, so Camber, I am just blown away by her. Um, I met her about three plus years ago through the Greenville, or Greenville Chambers Young Professionals Program. It's a mentor program. Uh, about 40 young professionals go through the program each year. Uh, Camera served in leadership role there, reached out to me, and so I've been a mentor for over three years now. Um, and when I think of Camber, I think about she has her pulse, 
on the young professionals, current and those generations coming into the workforce, and then also she's a voice for them. So when you think about Canberra, right, think about the young professionals, think about the companies, and she bridges that gap, and she does it quite well. Um, so you'll see she comes up, right? She's still young, but boy, she hit the ground running. Um, she's also been recognized as a young professional in the last, I think, two, three years. You've had awards being recognized um, in magazines, different associations as an up-and-coming emerging professional who has kind of hit the ground running. Um, and she'll give more of her own. I also want to point out on the table, her company is called the YoPro No, and you'll see the QR code on the back um, for further engagement. But her company has done extensive research interviewing with young professionals, and now she's actively consulting with companies, right, helping them bridge that gap, not only on engagement, but maybe more important on retainment. Um, and so with that, I'm going to welcome Camber. Thank you so much. I'm a, I'm a walker when I speak. I hope that's okay. <laughs> I'll try to stay near the camera, I promise. So it's so good to see all of you today. Thank you for having me. Again, my name is Camber Parker. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And I'm so excited to see so many of you in the room. It's great to see some familiar faces, but there are a lot of new faces. And so get excited because we are going to do a little bit of an icebreaker to warm people up. And I'm going to give you guys a few minutes so we're going to be like old friends in a, in a couple of minutes. So don't worry. Um, this is a hot topic, right? I can tell by hopefully some of the guests in the room who came for this, this reason and, and hearing this type of conversation. Um, I'm excited to talk to all of you about it because this conversation is not going away anytime soon. Talent, particularly young professional talent, is a huge conversation right now. And it's, it's a problem. We know that young professionals are leaving jobs at rapid rates. And so what I wanna to do today is give you guys some information, some background context, and also give you some tools and tips that you can take with you, not just in a couple of months, but tomorrow and start applying it to your companies. Um, and I know there are a lot of people in here with various backgrounds, right? There's people from all different generations. There are people from all different industries. And I guarantee that all of you will leave with something today that you can take with you tomorrow. So first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on me. And no, that is not a typo. Um, and for those of you, can you all see this behind me? Okay. Um, this is not a typo. I did not mess this up. But I want to show this because this is what young professionals will hear if you're not clear. Clear is kind. Expectations are key. If you're not clear, this is what they're going to hear. I'm sorry for any young professionals in the room. I've done the research, I promise. Doesn't mean that it's you who's doing this necessarily. Um, but actually, why I'm credible to be here today, um, yes, as Ramona pointed out, I am young. I'm turning 27 next week, but I've been in the workforce for five years. I didn't realize that's not a long time to many of you in the room. So trust me, I get it. But what I do have is the knowledge of close to 1,000 young professionals that I've interviewed over the years through my blog, in my podcast and also my peers, because I do know other 27 year olds and people in my life who have shared their struggles, their successes, and ultimately what makes them happy and successful in the workplace. And so that's how I started my business. I recently took it full time in 2022 and I help companies increase their recruiting and retention of young professionals. I do that in a, in a multitude of ways. And so one of those ways is actually through social media. So I do have some, some friends in the room and partners that I work with um, from a social media side because social media is a really great tool in recruiting and retaining young professionals. So we're gonna get to that today. But first, here's the truth. This is what I'm going to be telling you all today over and over again, is things are not changing, they've already changed. Now I recognize there are many of you in this room who might say, well, why is, why do I need to follow this? Why do I need to believe this? Because I wasn't a part of that change. Why does this matter to me? It's because it's already changed because of the pandemic. The name of this topic today is how do we adapt and engage young professionals in a post-pandemic workplace, okay? So we recognize that things have changed and uh, what we need to do moving forward, all of the people in this room is, are you gonna be ahead of the curve? or are you gonna stay behind and let the next generation of leaders 
just pass you by because this is this is really the important thing here is knowing that it, you all as future leader or excuse me as leaders how are you going to help raise up the future leaders of not just our work our workplace but our society i think right now more than ever we need people who are good people and at the basis of all of what i'm talking about is just being good to others right and respecting people so I want to bring up this stat, and I hope it's okay. I'm moving for a second. <laughs> um, I want to bring up this stat. So $30.5 billion. Um, this is the cost of young professional turnover in the U.S. economy annually. It's a lot of money. To put it in context, that is the cost of about 4 billion lattes. Um, I say that because, of course, I'm a millennial. So naturally, I'm going to spend $7 on a latte just because I can, right? Um, just kidding, but just because we are talking about young professionals and we love social media, right? We're the first digital natives. Um, this is also the, the current net worth of Mark Zuckerberg. So thought I would get a little Facebook nudge in there as well. You guys are gonna hear me talk a lot about young professionals and experienced professionals. So by definition, 21 to 39 year olds are young professionals. So I'm gonna make you guys uncomfortable here, but how many young professionals do we have in the room? 21 to 39. Yep, say it loud and proud, Ryan. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Um, and then, yeah, little round of applause. Um, and how many 40 plus, 40 plusers do we have? You're the experienced professionals. Yes. Um, it's important to say here as well that I am continually learning. What I'm telling you here today is yes, based on my research, but I am not going to be here and I'm not going to sit here in front of you and say that I know everything about this because you have so much to offer as experienced professionals. So I knew coming into this today who my audience was. And so I am speaking to you, but also recognizing there are some young professionals or yo pros in the room. And that's how I got my company name. Um, so I think that's important though, because there's always more to learn, right? So I mentioned I was going to make you guys get a little interactive. What comes to mind when you think of young professionals, specifically young professional talent? So I want everybody to think for a second. And if any brave souls would like to share, trust me, I've heard, I've heard it all. I've done this in presentations several times. You can't hurt my feelings. Um, I won't tell others outside of this room, I promise. Um, so are there any brave souls? Yes, Amy, I think. Lazy, yeah, ouch. Yeah. Yes. Work-life balance, absolutely. Yes. Energetic, thank you. Go ahead in the back there, Anisha. Anisha, yeah, okay. Innovative, yeah. I think there was another hand back there. What was that? Raw. All right, it's a new one. I'll add to my list. Yes, John. Tech savvy, yes. Yes, in the back. Values driven. Anyone else? Those were some great, some great words. We got a nice balance there, so I would call that half and half. Um, lazy is definitely one that we like, we often hear, um, entitled is another one, right? Um, but yeah, digital natives, right? We are innovative. We've had technology at our fingertips for our entire lives. Um, that's a valuable tool, right? But there's also the more negative connotations that are associated with young professionals. What I like to do is try to realize how are our experiences that I've had as a young professional how are they valuable to you as experienced professionals? And how are your values as experienced professionals valuable to me? And so that's where the being the bridge between the companies that want to hire and the young professionals lie. But I wanted to do that exercise because again, getting things out in the open is good, but none of this is coming as a surprise to me. I understand what people think of, but I also know what young professionals think of other generations, right? And so again, I'm not here to say names, but again, this is just coming back to the basics of being a human, right? We need to treat each other with respect. So Marty, you and I might not understand or see the same beliefs eye to eye, but we do need to learn how to work together in the workplace because not only is that going to help us individually in the workplace, that's going to help our companies, that's going to drive more business, it's going to drive more revenue, time, productivity, et cetera, et cetera. We are gonna talk about all of these things today. I am gonna shorten it a little bit because I wanna make sure we get to the meat of the presentation, which is tips that you guys can take. So I might skip a few things, but just know that I will be available after to talk. And this is just the first of many conversations I hope that you all will have with me today. So again, sorry, we're gonna go a little bit quicker. Um, 
why does this happen? Why are young professionals leaving? Based on the thousand interviews I've done with young professionals over the years, I've deduced that there are five main reasons, five main factors for young professionals staying and leaving a company. And it's these five things. Take a picture if you want to, jot it down. Um, and we're going to cover some of these things because we are going to talk about why young professionals, what they need to succeed. Now, these are not demands. I want to be really clear about that. Yes, I'm a voice for young professionals, but this is not me saying, we need this, we need that, because we understand that some people think that that's what young professionals are coming in and doing, right? This is, again, research-driven. This is showing that young professionals are leaving because communication is poor between generations, because expectations are not clear from the very beginning during the recruiting process, and that is not directly correlating to what is happening on the job. Culture. We're going to get to that in a little bit because that's a, that's a big one. Professional development. Um, what are you doing to help your young professionals succeed once they get into the job? And education. What training are they getting early on to help them be successful later? Because newsflash, if they don't get it in the early first year or first two years, they will go somewhere else because your competitors are doing it. So generations, and I want to make sure we're good on time here. Um, we have, I think, a very wide range of generations in this room today, which I think is really wonderful for the purpose of the conversation today. Just to make sure you guys are on the same page about some important traits, Gen Zers and the millennials who are the culprits that we're talking about today, right? The young professionals. The big things to focus on here are we're very entrepreneurial minded, right? This is something that I think is not new, innovative. Somebody mentioned earlier. Um, we are looking for social opportunities. We are looking for that work-life balance, values-driven. We're not trying to stay in the workplace 24-7 and not do anything outside of it because that's not what's important to us anymore. For some people, it might be, but we are seeing burnout because of the pandemic. We are recognizing that there is so much more outside of work and we can still be productive in our day-to-day -day jobs while also having a life outside of that. Um, the, the pandemic created these opportunities for us to see this. And then we also know our other generations in the workplace and some of their behavioral traits. I don't need to go through all of these, but I would say these are pretty spot on based on, again, the generaliz generalization of these, um, of these generations. But the main key here is behaviors. Another point to mention when you're looking at generational research, and I think we could do a whole entire presentation on this so you can have me back and I can talk about generations next time. But the biggest thing is, who do we need to look at when we are observing one single generation? Does anybody know? The parents. Who are the parents of the generations? <laughs> Again, not, not saying any names. I'm not calling any names out. But that's typically what you need to look at when you are observing the different generations you're working with. So why is this important to the conversation today? Because again, same, what I was talking about with Marty earlier, we might not see eye to eye on something, but in the workplace, it's going to help us much more if we understand that you're the way you are because you're in this generation and you had these experiences that you grew up with that caused you to act a certain way in the workplace, your communication styles, your culture, the way that you, things that you value, and they are different than what I value as a 27-year-old in the workplace. We don't need to agree, but we do need to understand and respect each other, and that will drive significant increases in communication, which have direct correlation to retention. So what do we want? What do we need, more importantly, to be successful? Because we're not just young professionals, we're future leaders of our companies, which will help your sustainability and your longevity in your businesses, and also just the workplace as a whole in our society. So that's another big message I want you to take away. But spoiler, we don't want pizza and beer carts and gift cards and whatever you guys think we want. Um, we don't want that. What we actually want is what I like to call the three R's, um, not reading, writing, and arithmetic but a reset on culture, reimagined purpose, reframed potential, 
These are three things that are very, very important. And we're going to give you guys tools today to do that in the remaining time that we have. So first, culture. Again, this is a big one, right? It's a buzzword that everybody's been talking about long before the pandemic started. But when you look at culture today, what are you doing in your businesses that allow flexibility, right? Most young professionals, if you haven't seen it in the news or you haven't heard about it yet, they want some kind of flexibility. I'm not telling you to have 100% remote work or 100% in office work because that really probably won't go over well. But again, just based on data, but what kind of flexibility are you offering so that they give them ownership? And we're gonna talk about that in a second. Purpose. Young professionals want to get up and be excited to work. Sue us. I'm sure that there's a lot of people in this room that grew up, again, based on what I know about generational research. It's not what I know about you as an individual, but based on this generational research that's out there and available, there are a lot of people in this room that you went to work for 30 years at the same company, worked your way up, wherever, whatever it may be, and you got to a point and then you maybe retired or you stayed there and you were really happy with that, but you were, that was what you did. Those days are over. And so I'm not here to tell you that I'm going to increase your retention for 30 years and have your young professional stay for 30 years. I'm trying to tell you that we can create a purpose for over two years because the average time for a young professional to stay at a job is about two years before they take off and job hop. So we can create purpose that, again, drives revenue, drives growth, drives productivity, maximizes those young professionals' careers so that when they leave, because they, they, there's a very good chance they could leave. When they do, they've made your company better. And that's the shift. And then potential. Young professionals want to grow despite the quiet quitting trend that we've all been hearing. And that's another conversation for another day. but. Despite what that, that trend says, we do want potential. We want that opportunity to grow. And so I'm going to share those answers now to wrap things up. Um, how do we fix this problem of young professionals staying, trying to, or excuse me, young professionals leaving? How do we get them to stay? How do we recruit them? Because that's another challenge in itself. And hopefully you all know today in the short time that we've had that recruiting and retention have a very, very direct correlation. So these are the tools to keep your pros empowered, engaged, and emerge them as future leaders. Um, and make sure, do we have any questions so far? Because I know I've gone through a lot of stuff. All right, great. That means I'm doing a good job. Um, all right, so to empower young professionals, we want to give them ownership and we want to create opportunities for them to lead. So why is this important? Because we are trying to give them that purpose right? And it gives them potential. So an example of this is, say you have a community coat drive, can good drive coming up. And maybe this is a young professional who just started working with you. It's a good test to kind of see, okay, let's see what they're made of. Can they lead a group? Can they, are they organized? What can they you know, really accomplish here? And it sounds small, but get them to coordinate the whole project, start to finish. And maybe if that goes well, then give it a step up and maybe start strong and start, you know, with something bigger right away. But those opportunities, rather than waiting until there's that first promotion, give them opportunities to lead so that you can empower them. Offer flexibility. We already talked about this, but can you create an opportunity in your workplace to offer a flex schedule? So whether that's going into work for four days and then you're working remote one of those days, whatever it might look like, just know that if you're not doing it, your competitors will be, and young professionals can just go on their phones. I mean, everybody can. A lot of this is, hopefully you know this, a lot of this can be applied to other generations, but they're going to go on their phone and LinkedIn is pulled up and there's recruiters out there who are, I don't know if there's any recruiters or HR people in this room, but I know you're out there um, and you're doing a great job. Good job. You're really doing your job. Um, But that's, there's other people on the other end who are looking for people. So again, you have to be offering some of these things, otherwise they will leave. And then share important vision and goals of your business. When young professionals have a better understanding and grip on where your company's heading, they're going to have that ownership. They're gonna have that purpose, which will drive their potential. 
And then understanding side hustle culture. People are very entrepreneurial in nature, these young professionals. And so if you have the ability to offer them ways to grow entrepreneurially while still getting their job for you done, that's a huge, huge win in your book because they're going to have opportunities to grow through that as well. Are you doing okay on time? Just a few more minutes. All right. Um, to engage your young professionals. This is another, a great one where I mentioned social media earlier. Engage them on social media because where are we? We're on social media. So recognize them in ways that you can do, again, based on your company. Sometimes there's regulations that are involved that, you know, if you work for a big bank, you can't do certain things. I understand that. But if you have the capacity to, recognize people for getting certain certifications. Recognize your young professionals um, if they did a community service project, I keep mentioning community because that's a very, um, very values-driven thing that young professionals want and need. Um, engage them on social media. So once they're on the other side of the recruiting pool and they are already in your company, how can you engage them by tagging them in various things on LinkedIn, on Instagram? Because what are they going to do? They're probably going to reshare it, um, which is a great recruiting tool for you on the other side. Ask them what they actually think. This is a really big one, and I can't emphasize this enough. Most companies that I talk to, they don't realize that they just haven't asked. Young professionals will leave, and it's maybe because we assume, oh, we're not paying them enough, or somebody grabbed them because they you know, have a beer cart, whatever it is. But a lot of times people don't ask. And so that's always my question. Are you asking once they leave? Or are you asking your young professionals while they're in, in your court what they actually do need to be successful? And again, very important caveat, I'm not telling you to give them everything they want. What do they need to be successful? And I'm just telling you now, it's not pizza, it's not beer cards, so stop doing that. And then lastly on here, reach them where they are. Offer mental health support other areas of interest. Know that this generation has experienced a lot when it comes to knowing people that maybe have suffered from mental health illness. Maybe they have themselves. It's not that it's any different from when some of you were growing up. It's just much more out in the open and people are very much aware of it. This generation is very aware of it. So just understanding that you should be offering, um, meeting them where they are, um, whether that's different employee resource groups, maybe that is offering them counseling, um, again, based on what size company you're in. And then other areas of interest. Community impact is the one that we've talked about a lot. A lot of young professionals are very active in social causes. So again, you don't need to believe what we believe, but you do need to understand that things have changed and they're not changing. They already have. So what can you do as business leaders to keep that young professional spirit alive and growing into future leaders. And then a great segue is we're emerging these young professional leaders into the future leaders of our workplace and our society. Map out their future at your company with them. Show them the roadmap to get from point A to point B because I know a lot of companies that don't do that. Sometimes it's because it's, it's a big company and it's hard to keep track, but my argument is if the bigger the company, the better you have the roadmap because there are more opportunities for growth. So even if you're a smaller business, maybe you're worried that you don't have those opportunities to grow for your young professionals, find ways that are and just be as clear as possible. Remember what I said earlier, blah, 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 blah. That's what they're going to hear if you're not clear. And that's what I'll hear if you're not clear as well. I don't want to just say they. Um, and share the clear milestones that they can reach to get them there. These are great ways and great tips that you can apply tomorrow to help this next generation of leaders. So I know that was very brief. Um, again, very top, you know, tip of the iceberg for this conversation of young professional talent. This conversation is not going away anytime soon. So like I said, this can be the first of many, but I encourage all of you to engage with me after today. I would love, love, love to hear what you thought about today. Maybe you learned something new. Maybe you heard something for the 14th time. And now you realize that maybe it's something you should bring back to your companies. Um, and so I would encourage all of you to find me on LinkedIn, if you can, Camber Parker, and just shoot me a note and tell me what you learned today. 
that helps me selfishly from a feedback perspective. But I'd also love to know what you're doing at your company because maybe you are doing some of these things very well. And so I'd love to know um, what you think. So in conclusion, are you going to be on the sidelines of this conversation or are you going to be ahead of the curve and start help, help raising this next generation of future leaders? Thank you so much for having me. I'm not really like closing for her, but I didn't want to embarrass her at the beginning. So wait, don't go away. Hold up your left hand. Oh Hold yes, I got engaged recently. How, oh. wait, well, I, I hear her say to Jim, oh, since last I saw you, there has been a change, you know? And so I, so Camber, like how, how recent this change? Oh, I'm three, no, two weeks ago. <laughs> so anyways, everybody who does know her, congratulations. I Jim and Joan, so <laughs> thank you guys very much. We clearly had a rock star with us today. I know if you have questions for us, she'll hang around afterwards and we'll probably enjoy connecting with you. And I hope you all were thinking how many things we do in this Rotary Club that ought to appeal to young professionals. And on your table, of course, there is a card for Discover Rotary suggestions. Think about some young professionals out there. How many of these things that matter to them we're already doing, including service and purpose that we, we really have in spades in this club? So thank you, Camber. As with all our speakers, we will donate a book to the Alexander Elementary School Library. And we so appreciate your being with us today and challenging us. And I would like to invite, before I close this, with a few comments. Uh, Dave Carflight, are you going to say a word about CART? Don't have to fumble, please. Change nothing. Fumble anyway. You can just go ahead and scan that QR code on your phone. Just scan that QR code on your phone. And we'll start putting money into a pile. The month <laughs> last month, was $131.35, so Wade has agreed to match it. All right, so our, right. our contribution is $262.70 for CART this month. And we have a new, uh, obviously, matching sponsor this month. And in the words of Bruce Springsteen, is there anybody alive out there? <laughs> if you are, it's not too late, because what you're going to see over the next couple weeks in England was planned a long time. Our, our planning person there is Mandy, right over there. And she works for Mackey Funeral Parlor on East Washington Street. That marks 150th anniversary this year. Mackey's a full, I'm sorry. Mackey's a full uh, mortuary with two locations, one over on Century Drive and one on Woodland Park. And the Woodland Park one was just renovated. If you want it to go the way you want it to go, make sure you do it before it's too late. Thanks so much. I was going to call up Ryan Brown today. I'll go ahead and mention his name. He is our first recipient of the three sticker for working for Alexander, working for Kringle, and bringing somebody to discover Rotary. Now, we may need to work on attendance for him because he's not here today, but otherwise, he is doing absolutely everything correct, but we will recognize him next time. Also, two, two other quick things, and I've got a, a comment, and then we'll, we'll close today. Uh, our next meeting will be Teacher of the Year. That is always a fabulous occasion to recognize our Teacher of the Year. Dr. Burke Royster, superintendent, will be with us as well. Think about public education fans you might like to bring to that meeting. And also, our fall social is coming up. This will be on October the 11th. Uh, Christine, Ryan Brown, and others have been working hard on this. It's going to be at Ink and Ivy. It should be a fun night from 6 to 9. You will hear more about it at the next meeting, and it will have a trivia theme to it. So that should be a great evening to bring people to our meeting. I would like to close by actually where Paul started us today in, in the prayer. I was so glad he remembered um, Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth. I know she is probably, and in, in the, the people, her subjects have been on, on all our hearts the, the last week or so. You may know her husband, Prince Philip, was for many years an honorary member of two different Rotary Clubs and regularly attended. And Her Late Majesty was actually the recipient in the year of her Diamond Jubilee in 2013, of Rotary International's Award of Honor. So here's a quotation from her. She said, to be inspirational, you don't have to save lives or win medals. I often draw strength from meeting ordinary people doing extraordinary things, volunteers, carers, community organizers, good neighbors, unsung heroes whose quiet dedication makes them special. They are an inspiration to those who know them. 
That's what we do in this club. We're ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I hope you take that to heart as you leave here today. So please join me in saying the four-way test. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? We are adjourned.